Uh, so I do lower extremity compartment syndrome. The majority of the compartment syndromes I do are the uh, traumatic ones, you know, with tibia fractures, upper extremity fractures. Uh, this is a little bit of a different, a uh, little bit of a different uh, beast that you guys are probably more used to seeing than, than actually I see. So you guys could probably teach me more about it. I do uh, do a little bit of speaking for these orthopedic companies. So we're talking about the history of compartment syndrome, uh, exertional compartment syndrome, as well as traumatic compartment syndrome, two totally different entities. Uh, we'll look at the relevant anatomy. We'll talk about the pathophysiology of why these things happen. And then more importantly, the reason uh, we're all here is to learn about diagnosis and treatment of these uh, injuries. So it was first described by Wilson on a trek to Antarctica. All these guys were walking miles and miles and miles. It was cold. Uh, a lot of reasons for the muscles not to be happy. And so that's when he first kind of kind of described uh, exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, Vaught in 19, uh, 1943 uh, kind of discussed it was March gangrene. Uh, French and Price in 1962 were the first ones that documented sort of the pathophysiology of this. It was actually due to increased muscle swelling in, in a tight compartment, which causes the elevation of pressures, decreased uh, arterial inflow, and subsequent uh, exertional compartment syndrome. And then finally, uh, a couple years before that, uh, Mayberg first described fasciotomy as a treatment uh, for this entity. So what we're talking about today is chronic exertional compartment syndrome. It's exercise-induced compartment syndrome. It very typically is a pain that happens very specific times, either a certain amount of uh, exercise or a certain distance of exercise happens very reproducibly. Uh, basically what happens as your muscles swell with exercise, there's decreased tissue perfusion uh, that when, once you stop the exercise, it goes away quickly. There's no permanent tissue damage and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's repetitive. Patients can tell you exactly how far they run or what, the, what exercise they're doing and it happens right away. So basically it's 10 pounds of you know what in a five pound bag. So it's just there's no space. The muscle fascia is like a, I usually describe it to patients, like a, it's like a very tight lady's hose. Um, it's, it's like a tight nylon and the muscle just can't swell anywhere. So the treatment is actually to, is to release that hose. This is totally different um, from what I normally deal with, which is an acute compartment syndrome. This is always like a high motor vehicle accident, motorcycles that we see out on the road all the time. Uh, the compartment pressure basically exceeds the ability of the blood flow to come in. And this is a, a very high level of tissue damage. <clears throat> it's progressive with time. So as the exertional compartment syndrome, as you, as you time goes on and you rest, pressures go down and you feel better. Acute compartment syndrome, swelling gets worse. It's a, it's a medical emergency, something like that. So relevant anatomy, <clears throat> there's four compartments in the leg. There's the ankle dorsiflexors, which is your anterior compartment your ankle everters, which is the perineal group in the lateral side, you have your posterior superficial, and finally your posterior deep. And here we see the anatomy. This is gonna be your anterior compartment. Over here, here's your lateral compartment next to the fibula. This is your superficial deep, which is your gastroxoleus complex. And finally, the deep compartment, which is just in between both surgically and with the striker uh, monitor, which we'll show you later. So incidence is about uh, 14 to 27 percent of chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Most of these studies were done on military uh, studies like the Navy studies that we were talking about before or athletic programs. And when these studies were being done, it was mainly males. So there, there is a male predominance, but those studies were kind of flawed. So it's probably similar rates, male to female. So basically what happens, you get arterial spasm as the muscles swell. You have decreased inflow. The capillaries get obstructed. Finally, the arteriovenous complex kind of collapses and then you have no outflow and it's a vicious cycle. And so what happens is you just, there's too much pressure and it's a, it's a repetitive cycle. And as you exercise more, it gets worse and worse. When you finally stop exercising, then it goes away. So muscles can actually swell by 20% when you exercise. And normal patients, uh, the swelling subsides after five minutes of rest. These patients that seem to be prone to exertional compartment syndrome, it takes up to 30 minutes or more for the swelling to decrease. And it probably has something to do with venous outflow from these patients that are just make them more prone uh, for the muscles to stay swollen. So basically, the, this is really a diagnosis of history, and this is the same for whether it's chronic exertional compartment syndrome or acute traumatic uh, compartment syndrome. Um, it's all in the history <clears throat> and, it's, and physical exam. You really don't need the striker catheter, which we'll talk about later. So most common sports, usually soccer, basketball, people doing a lot of running. Uh, symptoms occur very predictably. Like I said, the athlete can certainly tell you um, exactly how much time they run when it sets in or exactly how much exertion they're doing, you know, a certain amount of time on the treadmill or the elliptical. Um, symptoms uh, dissipate predictably with rest, and it rarely lasts for you know, more than a couple hours after they stop their exercise. It generally starts as a dull ache that then increases with activity, 
And once things get a little bit more serious is when they have that feeling of tightness, like the leg is just gonna, like gonna burst. They report a burning symptom. Burning symptoms always makes you think about nerves. And so the nerves are also getting compressed in this tight space where they have nowhere to expand. <clears throat> and you get this burning sensation. You have a sense of fullness. And again, there's a pain that radiates. So those nerves that are in the compartment of the leg, they go down and give you sensation in the foot. They'll feel that, that nerve radiating all the way down into the foot. It's usually, obviously they're in your office, it's serious enough that they can't compete. They can't do their sport. That's why they're in their office. So it frequently causes cessation of activity. And because there's something with these patients with their anatomy or their pathophysiology, it's almost always bilateral. So in terms of a, acute compartment syndrome, we talk about the five Ps, which is um, when, you, when you have an acute traumatic compartment syndrome, you can't even touch these patients. They're, they're screaming. They, they jump off the table. You just try to ankle dorsiflex or plantar flex them a little bit. They, they literally jump off the table. It's a very easy diagnosis in the, in the traumatic world. They have paresthesias, which is those radiating type pains. Poikilothermia, their foot is cold. There's pallor, and then finally there's pulselessness. Once you get to no pulses uh, in the acute world of acute com traumatic compartment syndrome, it's too late. The muscles are probably dead already. So you have very firm compartments, shiny skin, and again, the patient's in extreme pain. That's for acute traumatic syndrome. So on, on these patients, the anterior and lateral compartments are usually involved. They have a sense of fullness in, in that anterior compartment right over, the t right over the lateral aspect of the tibia, and this pain can radiate into the foot uh, as those nerves get involved. This is involved up to 60% of the time. The lateral is less frequent. The deep posterior is also involved 60% uh, of the time. These are your ankle plantar flexors. So the pain is more posterior. It radiates down to the plantar aspect of the foot as well as the medial aspect of the foot because that's where the nerves are in that compartment go to the medial aspect of the foot. And again, this is up to 60% of the time. Superficial compartment, much less common. So the two ones you really get the most common are the anterior compartment and the deep posterior compartment. So in terms of diagnosis, uh, MRI has, has kind of gained a little bit of popularity as we MRI just about everybody. And here we see a nice, uh, what's nice about the MRI is you get great anatomy here. So just like the, in the thing we showed you before, gastroxoleus com complex, the deep posterior group, the anterior group, and here's the less frequent, the lateral compartment and it just lights right up. So you get great anatomy. It's, it shows you exactly which compartment is involved, which would help you out surgically to know what to release. And so what you're seeing is an increased signal on a T2 weighted image. T2 is what makes things with edema look white. This is a relatively new technique as well. It's uh, also it's nice because it's non-invasive. And all you're basically measuring is oxygen saturation. So you'd have your patient work out. You put this sensor on their leg, and you'll see a decrease in oxygen uh, saturation in the deep muscles. And it's nice because it's uh, non-invasive. However, the gold standard is still the striker catheter, and this is a little catheter with an 18-gauge needle here, and so you would have, um, they used to do this with Dr. Beckler, we'd have them go run around. Our old office had a nice park right nearby, which is nice, so they go run around the park, come into the office, and then you basically put this needle into their legs. It's, it's invasive, it's painful for the patients, um, there's a serious learning curve. It's hard to use this thing. It sounds easy, just put the needle in, but you know, as, as you play with it, you see the pressure going up and down. It's, it's, uh, it's really kind of testy, and it takes some time to really get used to, to know how to use it. Um, but it is still, however, the gold standard, and it's, it's ultimate um, diagnostic uh, gold standard. The difficulty with this, again, is it's sometimes hard to know if you actually, the deep posterior compartment is, is fairly frequently involved, and it's really hard to know that you have the needle actually in that deep posterior compartment. The other compartments are easier to, uh, to know you're in the right compartment. So Pedowitz was the guy who, who came up with the criteria that we're all familiar with. Uh, and these patients using the striker catheter. So basically these patients, you know, most patients resting muscles are around five millimeters of mercury. These patients are already, because of their anatomy, their muscle girth, uh, their, whatever their venous outflow is, they have, they have a resting baseline that's already high, so they're already at set up for failure. So their resting pressures are 15 millimeters of mercury. One minute after exercise, it's over 30 millimeters of mercury. Now 30 millimeters of mercury in the traumatic world that, that I do usually deal with, that's an indication to take them right to the operating room. So. You know, this is a, it's a pretty high pressure. The reason these patients don't need to go right to the operating room, obviously, is that then we know it goes right down after they, after they stop their exercise. The third criteria is that at five minutes of resting, it's still over 20 millimeters of mercury. So basically, if you have one of these, you're considered to have a chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Obviously, if you have two, or three, uh, two of the three or three out of the three, then you're much more confident in your diagnosis. So there's a huge differential diagnosis, you know, which uh, we're all kind of touched on with a lot of our talks here. Chronic exertional compartment syndrome, again, it's, it's really history and physical, not so much that striker catheter. They, they get pain at an exact amount of time. Every time they, they'll tell you, doc, it's 20 minutes, it's 30 minutes, 
And as soon as I stop, the pain goes away. So it's pretty clear cut. Uh, and you diagnose that with the MRI, the infrared spectrometry, and the intracompartmental inter pressures. Medial tibial stretch syndrome is like Charlie was saying, when they're sort of tender along the entire tibia, it's sort of like a periosteitis. They can sometimes pick that up on a bone scan as well as an MRI. It's pain over that posterior medial border that's pretty, pretty diffuse throughout the entire tibia. That also is partially relieved by rest, not, not as much as uh, exertional compartment syndrome. Stress fractures, uh, like we were just discussing, it happens when they talk about something. There's a new training regimen. Someone who's not been in the track team also joins the track team. They get uh, fairly localized pain, point tenderness, uh, one spot of the tibia, and uh, it is only partially relieved as well with rest. As we just saw, MRI is really the gold standard. Uh, fascial defects, that tight fascia that encases our muscles, you can have little defects where the nerves come out of that fascia, which causes muscles to herniate. You can usually see it very clearly if you have someone uh, you know, bend down and it really flex that anterior compartment, you can usually see the muscle herniate. Usually asymptomatic, doesn't really usually cause too much pain. Nerve entrapment syndromes, we're going to get an EMG and nerve conduction studies. That's more of a radiating paresthesias type pain without that muscle swelling. Um, it's probably a little bit more constant. Also doesn't specifically hap happen after a certain amount of running or anything like that. Radiculopathy, uh, check the lumbar MRI. Pretty consistent physical exam <clears throat> with straight leg raising, femoral stretch testing, uh, what you're looking at. And finally, the vascular claudication is you're going to send someone to the vascular team. They're going to get an ABI. You're going to get EM, uh, sorry, angiograms. There's a rare cause of a popliteal artery uh, compartment syndrome, which can cause similar symptoms. So treatment, you can take up a new sport. This reminds me of a friend of mine went to Princeton, and uh, we came back. You know, they were still in session. We got out earlier than they did, and I went to a party in Princeton, and the guys were playing chess. I'm like, that's Princeton for you. So obviously, like Charlie was saying, we don't want people to give up running. So what we're really going to do is, is activity modification. We're going to decrease their training regimen, try to avoid that, that exercise that causes the, the exertional compartment syndrome. So there's one uh, study looked at activity modification. There people were taught to run a different way with a four-foot strike running technique, which maybe you guys can tell me what that is. I've, I've never seen it. They use it on 19 patients, so not the greatest study. But at baseline in six weeks, uh, teaching people how to run this way, they saw a 43% improvement in their symptoms and a 36% reduction in pressures, which is pretty impressive. Botox. This is uh, something that I've never heard about for, for compartment syndrome. But this study showed in 16 patients at four and a half months, uh, the exertional pain was gone in 15 of the patients, so that's pretty good. They did notice decreased strength when they put them on the testing machines, but patients didn't feel that it was a functional consequence, so it's unclear. How it works, still not really clear and then long term, probably need to get injected again. So Dr. Swan had a patient who had chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, Dr. Swan discussed doing a fasciotomy. Patient learned about some doctor in Montana doing Botox for $12,000 for the treatment. So maybe we should do it here and next year we'll get, all, get gold pens and robes when you come for this meeting. If we start injecting everybody with uh, Botox. So fasciotomy is still the gold standard. You're going to make two incisions, uh, depending on which compartments are involved. You can maybe only do one of the incisions. Your lateral incision will get you to the anterior and lateral compartments. You have to be careful with the superficial perineal nerve there. And the medial incision gets you to the deep posterior and the superficial posterior, and the saphenous nerve and vein are, are in that uh, surgical field, so you have to be wary of those. So here, just very simply, again, this is going to be your medial incision, which gets you to the anterior compartment and the lateral compartment. Sorry, the lateral incision. Your medial incision will get you to the deep posterior and the superficial posterior. That's how you release all those uh, compartments. So, we see here the picture of the leg. You would, this is more how you would release a traumatic compartment syndrome where you're saving someone's leg. For the sports-related uh, exertional compartment syndrome, you just make a little incision uh, at, towards the bottom of the ankle, and then you just slide your scissors up. And that's, that's that tight fascial tissue that's encasing those muscles, and you just release that. It allows the muscles then to have more room to swell, and their symptoms go away. And then we see the medial side with the saphenous vein is what's involved over there. So endoscopic fasciotomy, it's, uh, it's actually pretty good because you get much better visualization, so you can be less likely to injure that superficial perineal nerve, uh, which is really the, the major devastating consequence. If you nail the superficial perineal nerve, the patient obviously will not be very happy with you. This allows smaller incisions and better visualization, so I think it's a pretty good technique. Regardless of what uh, technique you use for fasciotomy, whether it's the open incision or the smaller incisions or the, or the endoscopic, uh, it's a very successful operation. 90% of patients uh, have complete uh, resolution of their symptoms. 
Again, the deep posterior is less successful because I think it's probably a lot of times when the surgeon thinks they're releasing the deep posterior, they really aren't, especially if you're using those little incisions. It's very difficult to get to the back of the tibia um, without making a bigger incision and knowing for sure that you're in that deep posterior compartment. So there's, there's a complication rate. Uh, obviously, patients can bleed. You get hematomas, infections. Nerve injury is really the one that uh, you really worry about. DVTs are always common. And again, the recurrence rate of 3 to 12% um, is probably due to the fact that you probably the, the compartment was not released that you thought you were releasing. So in summary, uh, chronic exertional compartment syndrome is uh, fairly uncommon, thankfully. Diagnosis and management can be challenging because we saw the differential diagnosis, all these different things that cause leg pain in these athletes. So with regard specifically to exertional compartment syndrome, it really pays to know your anatomy and the compartments of the legs so you know what's involved, you know how to test for it, you know where to put the striker catheter if you're going to do that. Uh, proper history and physical, uh, if, it's, if it's positive on the striker catheter, then that's, that's really the, the best of all worlds because you have a good history, a good physical, and then the compartment center, uh, pressures to back you up, then you're, you're pretty sure with greater than 90% success that patient's going to do very well with the compartment release. Um, fasciotomy is the standard of care for the athletes that are unwilling to modify or change their activities. And then finally, I'm a trauma surgeon, so uh, I don't do the little incisions. That's, that's how I do a compartment release. So you probably don't want to send your athletes to me. Those are, a, those are little antibiotic beads. This is a patient who had a compartment syndrome and an infection. So those little beads we put in there that elude antibiotics to help uh, prevent infection from setting in.